On this spring afternoon, the house of Menander is quiet. In the bedrooms and passageways, still bright with 2,000-year-old paint, the only sound is the patter of rain. At a moment like this, it's hard to imagine what it must have been like here on the day Pompeii died, when the floors trembled with seismic shocks and the thunder of the eruption filled the rooms. As a rain of burning ash buried the garden and hissed over the roof, this house must have seemed like a refuge. But when the pyroclastic flows came, with their waves of boiling mud and lung-searing heat, it became a tomb. These days, fortunately, the house of Menander is more welcoming. Since being excavated nearly a century ago, this lavish mansion has been one of the highlights of a visit to Pompeii. The short tour we'll take in this episode of Virtual Vacations provides a taste of its many treasures. By the time it was destroyed by Vesuvius, the house of Menander was about 300 years old. It was a huge structure, expanded and extended until it spanned an entire city block. It had a private bath, stables, cellars, kitchens, and slave quarters. But the richest part of the house, and the parts that most tourists see today, were the public rooms around the atrium and courtyard. In the house of Menander, as in most large Pompeian residences, the atrium was a rather dim space just inside the main entrance, lit by a small skylight. This was the most public part of the house, in the heart of its oldest section. Behind the atrium, deeper inside, was a large courtyard, planted as a garden and surrounded by a colonnade. This was a more private area, beside which the house's owners and their guests ate in warm weather. Other spaces for dining and entertainment opened from the atrium courtyard axis. More private rooms were displaced to the margins of the house and the second story. The walls of the main rooms were painted with a brilliant mixture of pigments and hot wax. Since fashions changed over time, it is customary to distinguish four styles, or phases, of artistic development. The oldest paintings, the so-called first style, imitate the marble walls of temples and public buildings. This convention gradually gave way to the more exciting second style, when artists painted whole cityscapes on walls. The second style was succeeded by the minimalist and elegant third style, characterized by monochrome walls accented with delicate figures and scenes. This was followed by the fourth style, which combined the second style's architectural illusionism with the elaborate motifs of the third style. Although most of the House of Menander's rooms are painted in the fourth style, a few areas, most notably the baths, preserve older decorative schemes. The House of Menander, uncovered between 1926 and 1932, was one of the most spectacular Pompeian discoveries of the 20th century. A large collection of silverware was discovered during the excavations, and the building was initially called the House of the Silver Treasure. Its usual name comes from a painting of the playwright Menander found beside the courtyard. On the basis of stray finds, it has been conjectured that the house's final owner was Quintus Popeius Sabinus, a relative of Nero's second wife. This, however, is uncertain. And now, at last, we tour the house. We'll start at the main entrance, walk through the atrium, and then check out the rooms around the courtyard, which is labeled I in this plan. So, without any further ado, some slightly shaky footage. As we enter, we see a temple-shaped shrine for the household gods. The atrium itself is a high-ceilinged room with a central skylight. A pool for rainwater is directly below. To our left is an ala, or alcove, as you can tell from the mix of panels and detailed scenes, the painted walls belong to the fourth style. The side of the atrium opposite the main entrance opens onto the room known as the Taplinum. Here, as in many Pompeian houses, it's really just a glorified hallway. But it had an important function, as the place where the master of the house did business and received guests. And, as you can see, it has nifty fourth-style paintings. The most impressive part of the House of Menander is the peristyle courtyard. Twenty-three ionic columns support the roof of the covered walkway around the courtyard's perimeter. The garden itself has been replanted, 
and likely looks much as it did 2,000 years ago. A series of rooms, some of uncertain function, open onto the courtyard. The most important was this one, the triclinium, or dining room. During meals, couches stood along the walls, and food was served from low tables in the center of the room. The most striking room in the house, however, is the small chamber beside the triclinium. Here were found three skeletons, belonging to two men and one woman. A hoe and pickaxe were discovered with them, next to holes in the walls the victims made as they tried to dig their way out after the room's door was blocked by ash. Ten more skeletons were discovered nearby, apparently the remains of a group that took shelter in a second-story corridor. This group was found huddled around a single bronze lantern, which would have been their only light amid the darkness of the eruption. Along the south side of the courtyard, we find a series of fine paintings. This one shows the myth of Acteon, the huntsman cursed by Diana to be torn apart by his own hounds. Beside it is the painting of the playwright Menander that gives the house its name. Past Menander, we have some fancy stucco work and landscape painting. Here we see a small shrine to the gods of hearth and home, and, with a final flash of Pompeii and red, we turn back to the courtyard and end our tour. That's all, folks. For more on the houses of Pompeii, check out toldenstone.com. I hope you enjoyed our short tour, and encourage you, if you haven't already, to visit the House of Menander in person if you ever get the chance. In the meantime, as always, thanks for watching.